this strategy to win the war of lust. The Word of God speaks to the depths of our sensual desire. The truth of God's unwavering standard of holiness calls our moral failings into question. The Bible contains words of wisdom and instruction that encourage us to trust God for liberation from worldly desire. Flee immorality. 1 Corinthians 6 verses 12 to 13. Everything is permissible for me, but not all things are beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be enslaved by anything and brought under its power, allowing it to control me. Food is for the stomach, and the stomach for food, but God will do away with both of them. The body is not intended for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body, to save, sanctify, and raise it again because of the sacrifice of the cross. Paul says, foods for the stomach, and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. This means that the human stomach has been so constructed that it can receive and digest foods, and yet we should not live for food because they are only of temporary value. They should not be given an undue place in the believer's life. Don't live as if the most significant thing in life is to gratify your appetites. Although God wonderfully designs the body for the reception and assimilation of food, there is one certain thing. The body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. God never intended for the human body to be used for vile or impure purposes when He created it. Rather, He intended for it to be used for the Lord's glory and blessed service. This verse contains something incredible that should not be overlooked. Not only is the body for the Lord, but the thought that the Lord is for the body is even more wonderful. This means that the Lord is concerned about our bodies, their well-being, and proper use. God desires that our bodies be presented to Him as a living sacrifice that is holy and acceptable. Romans 12 verse 1, Amplified Bible Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, dedicating all of yourselves set apart as a living sacrifice, holy and well-pleasing to God, which is your rational, logical, intelligent act of worship. As Erdman says, without the Lord, the body can never attain its true dignity and its immortal destiny. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 14 And God has not only raised the Lord to life, but will also raise us up by His power. The fact that the Lord is for the body is additionally explained in this verse. God has not only raised up the Lord Jesus from among the dead, but He will also raise us up by His power. His interest in our body does not end at the time of death. He will raise the body of every believer to fashion it like the glorious body of the Lord Jesus. We will not be disembodied spirits in eternity. Instead, our spirit and soul will be reunited with our glorified body, thus enjoying the glories of heaven forever. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 15 Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Am I therefore to take the members of Christ and make them part of a prostitute? Certainly not. To further highlight the necessity for personal purity in our lives and guarding our bodies against impurity, Paul reminds us that our bodies are members of Christ. Every believer is a member of the body of Christ. Is it proper then to take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? To ask the question is to answer it, as Paul does with an indignant, certainly not. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 16 Do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says, the two shall be one flesh. Two bodies become one in the act of sexual union. We are told this at the dawn of creation. Genesis 2 verse 24, Amplified Bible. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. As a result, if a believer is joined to a harlot, it is the same as making a member of Christ a member of a harlot. The two would merge into one body. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 17, But the one who is united and joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. 
Just as in the physical act, there is a union of two into one. So when a person believes in the Lord Jesus Christ and is joined to him, the believer and Christ become so united that they can subsequently be spoken of as one spirit. This is the most perfect merging of two persons that is possible. It is the closest type of a union. Therefore, Paul's argument is that those who are thus joined to the Lord should never tolerate any union that would conflict with this spiritual wedlock. A.T. Pearson notes, The sheep may wander from the shepherd, and the branch be cut off from the vine, the member be severed from the body, the child alienated from the father, and even the wife from the husband. But when two spirits blend in one, what shall part them? No outward connection or union, even of wedlock, is so emphatically expressive of perfect merging of two lives in one. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 18 Run away from sexual immorality in any form, whether thought or behavior, whether visual or written. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the one who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. As a result, the apostle cautions the Corinthians to avoid sexual immorality. They are not to experiment with it or play with it. They're supposed to flee. A beautiful Bible illustration of this can be found in Joseph's story when he was tempted to sin by Potiphar's wife. Genesis 39 verses 6 to 12 Amplified Bible. So Potiphar left all that he owned in Joseph's charge, and with Joseph there, he did not need to pay attention to anything except the food he ate. Now Joseph was handsome and attractive in form and appearance. Then after a time, his master's wife looked at Joseph with desire, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused, and said to his master's wife, Look, with me in the house, my master does not concern himself with anything. He has put everything that he owns in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God and your husband? And so it was that she spoke to Joseph persistently day after day, but he did not listen to her plea to lie beside her or be with her. Then it happened one day that Joseph went into the house to attend his duties and none of the men of the household were there in the house. She caught Joseph by his outer robe, saying, Lie with me. But he left his robe in her hand and ran, and got outside the house. While there may be safety in numbers, sometimes there is more safety in flight. Then Paul adds, Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Most sins have no direct effect on one's body, but sexual immorality is unique because it directly affects one's body. A person reaps the consequences of this sin in his own body. While it is true that gluttony and drunkenness affect a person's body, most sins do not, and not even overconsumption or drunkenness affects the body as directly, as much, or as destructively as immorality. Sex outside marriage inevitably and irresistibly works havoc on the offender. Many Christians imagine that the Christian life would be much smoother if only we could recover the conditions of a previous era. It is assumed that if we could only return to those times, all would be well. People forget, of course, that the Church of New Testament times had problems too. When we turn to Paul's letters to the Corinthians, we find a church with problems that threatened to wreck its life and ministry. No church founded by Paul had more problems than the one at Corinth. But let us be thankful to God that as a result of their difficulties, we have these two marvelous letters. The problems were undoubtedly severe. They had immorality of the worst kind, a man living in sin with his mother or possibly his stepmother a practice that even pagans would have condemned. Some of them had been drunk at the Lord's table. Furthermore, they had misunderstood basic Christian doctrine. It must have been tempting to write off such a church, but Paul did not. He wrote to them and visited them in the hope that they would see their errors and return to a better way of life. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19 Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is within you? whom you have received as a gift from God, and that you are not your own property. Paul reminds the Corinthians once more 
that they have a holy and dignified calling. Had they forgotten that their bodies were the Holy Spirit's temple? The solemn truth of Scripture is that every believer is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. How could we ever consider using a body in which the Holy Spirit resides for evil purposes? 1 Corinthians 6 verse 20 You were bought with a price. You were actually purchased with the precious blood of Jesus and made His own. So then honor and glorify God with your body. By both creation and redemption, we are the Lord's. His claim to us dates back to Calvary. We were purchased at a cost. We see the price that the Lord Jesus placed on us at the cross. He thought we were so valuable that He was willing to pay for us with His own precious blood. How much Jesus had to love us to bear our sins in His body on the cross. As a result, I can no longer think of my body as mine. If I take it and use it the way I want, I am acting as a thief, taking what does not belong to me. Rather, I must use my body to glorify God, the one who owns it. A popular Bible commentator explained, Head, think of him whose brow has thorn girt. Hands, toil for him whose hands were nailed to the cross. Feet, speed to do his behest whose feet were pierced. Body of mine, be his temple whose body was wrung with pains unspeakable. We should also glorify God in our spirit, since both material and immaterial parts of man are God's. The Bible also warns us in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12 to 13, Amplified Bible. Therefore, let the one who thinks he stands firm, immune to temptation, being overconfident and self-righteous, take care that he does not fall into sin and condemnation. No temptation, regardless of its source, has overtaken or enticed you that is not common to human experience, nor is any temptation unusual or beyond human resistance. But God is faithful to His Word, He is compassionate and trustworthy, and He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability to resist. But along with temptation, He has in the past and is now and will always provide the way out as well, so that you will be able to endure it without yielding and will overcome temptation with joy. They serve as a warning to the arrogant. Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Perhaps this refers specifically to the firm believer who believes he can indulge in self-gratification without being affected by it. Such a person is especially vulnerable to God's disciplinary hand. Temptation operates like rocks in a harbor. When the tide is low, everybody sees the risk and evades it. However, Satan's strategy in temptation is to raise the tide to cover the dangers of temptation. Then he likes to bash you upon the concealed rocks. Then Paul adds a beautiful word of encouragement to those tempted. He teaches that the tests, trials, and temptations we face are universal. However, God is faithful and will not put us through more than we can handle. He does not promise to deliver us from temptation or testing, but He does promise to limit the severity of such experiences. He also promises to provide a means of escape so that we can bear it. Reading this verse, one cannot help but be struck by the tremendous comfort it has afforded to tested saints of God through the centuries. Paul would reassure them that God would not allow any unbearable temptation to come their way. At the same time, they should be cautioned not to expose themselves to temptation. Whatever happens, act in a way that is worthy of the gospel of Christ. Philippians 1 verse 27 only be sure to lead your lives in a manner that will be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I do come and see you or remain absent, I will hear about you that you are standing firm in one spirit and one purpose, with one mind striving side by side, as if in combat for the faith of the gospel. But test all things carefully, so you can recognize what is good. Hold firmly to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil, Withdraw and keep away from it. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you through and through, that is, separate you from profane and vulgar things, make you pure and whole and undamaged, consecrate to him, set apart for his purpose, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept complete and be found blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5 
verses 21 to 23. Amplified Bible. All for our parts, we need to be preserved entire, that is, complete and sound. We need to preserve ourselves from everything that would hinder the testimony of the Holy Spirit to the saints' relationship with God. We also need to preserve the body from defilement and evil uses. What Jesus said about lust that many people do not know. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, that everyone who so much as looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 and 28. Jesus remarks, You have heard that it was said to those of old. Now Jesus addresses the teachings they had previously received concerning the law of adultery, the seventh commandment. Exodus chapter 20, verse 14. You shall not commit adultery. We have here, an explanation of the seventh commandment given us by the same hand that made it the law no one understood the law more than jesus therefore he was fittest to be the interpreter of it adultery is the law against uncleanness the law restrained sinful passions and this restrained sinful appetites the pharisees understood the command against adultery but the Pharisees, in their explanations of this command, made it extend no further than the act of adultery. They did not cover that iniquity was only regarded in the heart. Whosoever looketh on a woman, not only another man's wife as some would have it, but any woman, to lust after her, has committed adultery with her in his heart. Matthew chapter 5 verse 28 James chapter 1 verse 15 Then when the illicit desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin has run its course, it gives birth to death. It is a dangerous step towards sin, where lust is dwelled on and approved. It is the commission of sin. The eye is both the inlet and outlet of a great deal of wickedness of this kind. Witness Joseph's mistress. Then after a time, his master's wife looked at Joseph with desire, and she said, Lie with me. Genesis chapter 39, verse 7. We also see this I challenge with David. One evening, David got up from his couch and was walking on the flat roof of the king's palace. And from there, he saw a woman bathing, and she was very beautiful in appearance. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 2. Lastly, we see this in Samson. Judges chapter 16, verse 1. Then Samson went to Gaza and saw a prostitute there and went in to her. We read, The eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 14. They have eyes full of adultery constantly looking for sin, enticing and luring away unstable souls. Having hearts trained in greed, they are children of a curse. Job in the Bible was a wise man, and he made a covenant with his eyes. Job chapter 31 verse 1 I have made a covenant, agreement with my eyes. How then could I gaze lustfully at a virgin? Such looks and such dalliances are so very dangerous and destructive to the soul. Matthew chapter 5 verses 29 and 30 If your right eye makes you stumble and leads you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. That is, remove yourself from the source of temptation. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble and leads you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. That is, remove yourself from the source of temptation. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. 
Here Jesus uses a figure of speech and does not speak literally. Jesus makes us ponder the eternal danger of lust. Heaven and hell are at stake in what you do with your eyes and the thoughts of your imagination. We must resolve to keep the body under control and bring it into submission, to live a life of mortification and self-denial, to maintain a constant watch over our hearts and to suppress the first rising of lust and corruption there, to avoid the occasions of sin, resist the beginnings of it, and decline the company of those who will be a snare to us, to keep out of harm's way, and to limit our use of lawful things when we find them tempting, and to seek God's grace, and to rely on it daily, to walk in the Spirit, and not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Remember, it is not unbecoming for a minister of the gospel to preach of hell and damnation. In fact, he must do so, as Christ did. And we are unfaithful to our trust if we do not warn of the coming wrath. There are some sins from which we need to be saved with fear, particularly fleshy lusts, which are such natural brute beasts as cannot be checked, but by being frightened cannot be kept from a forbidden tree, but by cherubim with a flaming sword. Jesus said heaven and hell are at stake in what you do with your eyes and with the thoughts of your imagination. The stakes are much higher than a lot of people can imagine. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11 Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers in this world to abstain from the sensual urges, those dishonorable desires that wage war against the soul. Colossians chapter 3, verse 6 Because of these sinful things, the divine wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience, those who fail to listen and who routinely and obstinately disregard God's precepts. Galatians chapter 5, verse 21 Envy, drunkenness, riotous behavior, and other things like these. I warn you beforehand, just as I did previously, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. When we are tempted to think it hard to deny ourselves and to crucify fleshly lusts, we ought to consider how much harder it will be to lie forever in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. Those do not know or do not believe what hell is that will rather venture their eternal ruin in those flames than deny themselves the gratification of a base and brutish lust. In hell, there will be torments for the body. The whole body will be cast into hell, and there will be torment in every part of it, so that if we have a care of our bodies, we shall possess them in sanctification and honor, and not in the lusts of uncleanness. Even those duties that are most unpleasant to flesh and blood are profitable for us, and our master requires nothing from us but what he knows to be for our advantage. Jesus' most famous message, the Sermon on the Mount, focused on the hearts of his listeners. He targeted his disciples as the audience and proceeded to preach what we now call the Beatitudes. He called his men to be different, to see the world from God's perspective, to relate to people in a supernatural fashion. Maintaining one's sexual purity requires more than simply abstaining from engaging in lustful activity, and it is also something that involves the heart. Do not commit adultery was another of the commandments that many people probably assumed they could check on a list of sins successfully dodged. But Jesus said that looking at a woman lustfully is to commit adultery with her in your heart. Immoral actions, then, begin with immoral thoughts, and the immoral thoughts are evil too. You can't address sin by only dealing with external actions. Lust is a vivid illustration of the kind of sin that Jesus urged his followers to avoid, and in today's culture, it presents a significant obstacle to the pursuit of moral purity. 
Jesus desires for his disciples to have such a profound commitment to moral purity that they are ready to cut off anything in their lives that tempts them to sin. But what is lust? Lust is a sexual desire that dishonors its object and disregards God. Sexual desire in itself is good. God made it in the beginning. It has its proper place. But it was made to be governed or regulated or guided by two concerns, honor toward the other person and holiness toward God. Lust dishonors its object. Take honor, for instance. God established a relationship called marriage. In it, a man and a woman make a lifelong covenant to honor each other. Sexual desire becomes the helper and the zest of that covenant bond of mutual honor. Therefore, to say to another person, I want you to satisfy my sexual desire, but I do not want you as a covenant partner in marriage, basically means, I want to use your body for my pleasure, but as a whole person, I don't want you. And that is dishonoring, and therefore lustful. Lust is sexual desire minus a commitment to honor the other person. Lust disregards God. The root of lust is a lack of regard for God. Living in supreme regard for a holy God is holiness, and the polar opposite is lust. Lust is defined as sexual desire that is not governed, regulated, or guided by a supreme regard for God. God created sexuality. He made it beautiful and good. He made it for the benefit of his creatures. He alone has the wisdom and authority to teach us how to use it for his glory and our honor. When we give sexual desire free reign and disregard for God, it becomes lust. Lust is a sexual desire that despises its object and disregards God. It is a corruption of a good thing due to a lack of honorable commitment and supreme regard for God. It is lust if your sexual desire is not guided by respect for the honor of others and reverence for God's holiness. Pondering the Danger of Lust Many people think lustful sexual attitudes are a matter of relatively insignificant personal piety. What counts is whether you boycott the latest news. Sleeping around is no big deal, and flipping through destructive content is insignificant. That is how the religious human mind reasons when supreme regard for God has been forsaken. But that is not what God has said. What is God's estimate of how important you are? Is it a big deal? This means that the consequences of lust will be worse than the consequences of otherworldly activities. All that work and do is extinguish the body. And Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verses 4 and 5, I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that of nothing more that they can do. But I will point out to you whom you should fear. Fear the one who, after he is killed, has authority and power to hurl you into hell. Yes, I say to you, stand in great awe of God and fear him. In other words, God's vengeance is much more fearful than earthly annihilation. And according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 6, God's vengeance is coming upon those who disregard the warning against lust. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 6 and that in this matter of sexual misconduct, no man shall transgress and defraud his brother, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we have told you before and solemnly warned you. The word of God speaks to the depths of our sensual desire. The truth of God's unwavering standard of holiness calls our moral failings into question. The Bible contains wisdom and instruction that encourage us to trust God for liberation from worldly desire. Flee immorality. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 12 and 13. All things are permitted for me, but not all things are of benefit. 
all things are permitted for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food. However, God will do away with both of them. But the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. Although God wonderfully designs the body for the reception and assimilation of food, there is one certain thing. The body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. God never intended the human body to be used for vile or impure purposes when he created it. Instead, he intended it to be used for the Lord's glory and blessed service. This verse contains something incredible that should not be overlooked. Not only is the body for the Lord, but the thought that the Lord is for the body is even more amazing. This means that the Lord is concerned about our bodies, well-being, and proper use. God desires that our bodies be presented to Him as a living sacrifice that is holy and acceptable. As Erdman says, Without the Lord, the body can never attain its true dignity and its immortal destiny. His interest in our body does not end at the time of death. He will raise the body of every believer to fashion it like the glorious body of the Lord Jesus. We will not be disembodied spirits in eternity. Instead, our spirit and soul will be reunited with our glorified body, thus enjoying the glories of heaven forever. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15 do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Am I therefore to take the members of Christ and make them part of a prostitute? Certainly not. Every believer is a member of the body of Christ. Is it proper then to take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? To ask the question is to answer it, as Paul does with an indignant certainly not. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16 Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says the two shall become one flesh. Two bodies become one in the act of sexual union. We are told this at the dawn of creation. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24 For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother, and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. As a result, if a believer is joined to a harlot, it is the same as making a member of Christ a member of a harlot. The two would merge into one body. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 But the one who is united and joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Just as in the physical act, there is a union of two into one. So when a person believes in the Lord Jesus Christ and is joined to him, the believer and Christ become so united that they can subsequently be spoken of as one spirit. This is the most perfect merging of two persons that is possible, and it is the closest type of a union. Therefore, Paul argues that those who are thus joined to the Lord should never tolerate any union that would conflict with his spiritual wedlock. A. T. Pearson notes, The sheep may wander from the shepherd, and the branch be cut off from the vine, the member be severed from the body, the child alienated from the father, and even the wife from the husband. But when two spirits blend in one, what shall part them? No outward connection or union, even of wedlock, is so emphatically expressive of perfect merging of two lives in one. The Apostle cautions the Corinthians to avoid sexual immorality, and they are not to experiment with it or play with it. They're supposed to flee. A beautiful Bible illustration of this can be found in Joseph's story when he was tempted to sin by Potiphar's wife. While there may be safety in numbers, sometimes there is more safety in flight. Then Paul adds, Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality 
sins against his own body. Most sins have no direct effect on one's body, but sexual immorality is unique because it directly affects one's body. A person reaps the consequences of this sin in his own body. While it is true that gluttony and drunkenness affect a person's body, most sins do not. And not even overconsumption or drunkenness affects the body as directly, as much, or as destructively as immorality. Sex outside marriage inevitably and irresistibly works havoc on the offender. Many Christians imagine that the Christian life would be much smoother if only we could recover the conditions of a previous era. It is assumed that if we could only return to those times, all would be well. People forget, of course, that the Church of New Testament times had problems too. When we turn to Paul's letters to the Corinthians, we find a church with problems threatening to wreck its life and ministry. No church founded by Paul had more issues than the one at Corinth. But let us be thankful to God that we have these two marvelous letters as a result of their difficulties. The problems were undoubtedly severe. They had immorality of the worst kind, a man living in sin with his mother, or possibly his stepmother, a practice that even pagans would have condemned. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is within you, whom you have received as a gift from God, and that you are not your own property? Paul reminds the Corinthians once more that they have a holy and dignified calling. Had they forgotten that their bodies were the Holy Spirit's temple? The solemn truth of Scripture is that the Holy Spirit indwells every believer. How could we ever consider using a body in which the Holy Spirit resides for evil purposes? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20 You were bought with a price. You were actually purchased with the precious blood of Jesus and made His own. So then, honor and glorify God with your body. By both creation and redemption, we are the Lord's. His claim to us dates back to Calvary. We were bought at a cost. We see the price the Lord Jesus placed on us at the cross. He thought we were so valuable that he was willing to pay for us with his precious blood how much Jesus had to love us to bear our sins in his body on the cross. As a result, I can no longer think of my body as mine. If I take it and use it the way I want, I am acting as a thief, taking what does not belong to me. Rather, I must use my body to glorify God who owns it. A popular Bible commentator exclaimed, Head, Think of him whose brow was thorn-girt. Hands. Toil for him whose hands were nailed to the cross. Feet. Speed to do his behests whose feet were pierced. Body of mine. Be his temple whose body was wrung with pains unspeakable. We should also glorify God in our spirit, since both material and immaterial parts of man are God's. The Bible also warns us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. Therefore, let the one who thinks he stands firm, immune to temptation, being overconfident and self-righteous, take care that he does not fall into sin and condemnation. No temptation, regardless of its source, has overtaken or enticed you that is not common to human experience nor is any temptation unusual or beyond human resistance. But God is faithful to his word. He is compassionate and trustworthy, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability to resist. But along with the temptation, he has in the past and is now, and will always provide the way out as well, so that you will be able to endure it without yielding, and will overcome temptation with joy. They serve as a warning to the arrogant, 
Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Perhaps, this refers specifically to the firm believer who believes he can indulge in self-gratification without being affected by it. Such a person is especially vulnerable to God's disciplinary hand. Temptation operates like rocks in a harbor. When the tide is low, everybody sees the risk and evades it. However, Satan's strategy in temptation is to raise the tide and to cover the dangers of temptation. Then he likes to bash you upon the concealed rocks. Then Paul adds a beautiful word of encouragement for those tempted. He teaches that the tests, trials, and temptations we face are universal. However, God is faithful and will not put us through more than we can handle. He does not promise to deliver us from temptation or testing, but he does promise to limit the severity of such experiences. He also promises to provide a means of escape so that we can bear it. Reading this verse, one cannot help but be struck by the tremendous comfort it has afforded to tested saints of God through the centuries. Paul would reassure them that God would not allow any unbearable temptation to come their way. At the same time, they should be cautioned not to expose themselves to temptation. Whatever happens, act in a way that is worthy of the gospel of Christ. Philippians chapter 1 verse 27 Only be sure to lead your lives in a manner that will be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I do come and see you or remain absent, I will hear about you that you are standing firm in one spirit and one purpose, with one mind striving side by side, as if in combat, for the faith of the gospel. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 21 to 23 But test all things carefully, so you can recognize what is good. Hold firmly to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Withdraw and keep away from it. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you through and through, that has separate you from profane and vulgar things, make you pure and whole and undamaged, consecrated to him, set apart for his purpose. And may your spirit and soul and body be kept complete and be found blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. All of our parts need to be preserved entire, that is, complete and sound. We need to preserve ourselves from everything that would hinder the testimony of the Holy Spirit to the saints' relationship with God. What Apostle Paul said about lust. Set your mind and keep focused habitually on the things above, the heavenly things, not on things that are on the earth which have only temporal value. For you died to this world, and your new, real life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So put to death and deprive of power the evil longings of your earthly body with its sensual, self-centered instincts, immorality, impurity, sinful passion, evil desire, and greed, which is a kind of idolatry because it replaces your devotion to God. Because of these sinful things, the divine wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience, those who fail to listen, and who routinely and obstinately disregard God's precepts. Colossians chapter 3, verse 2 through 6. Therefore, put to death your members. Therefore points back to our identification with the risen and enthroned Lord Jesus. Because we comprehend this reality, we have the ability to put to death the things in our lives that conflict with our identity as followers of Jesus. A popular Bible commentator said, The verb necrosate, meaning literally to make dead, is very strong. It suggests that we are not simply to suppress or control evil acts and attitudes, and we are to wipe them out, completely exterminate the old way of life. We put to death in the sense of denying these things and considering them dead to us and us dead to them. To gratify any sensual appetite is to give it the very food and nourishment by which it lives, thrives, and is active. Clark There is importance in listing and naming these sins as Paul does in this section. 
It is far easier to drift into a sin which one does not know by name than consciously to choose one whose very title should be repugnant to a Christian. Right. We then read these three terms, fornication, uncleanness, passion, and evil desire. All of these manifestations refer to sexual transgressions, a straightforward yet sneaky form of greed, covetousness, is nothing less than an act of idolatry. Covetousness can be extremely harmful in several different ways, including the following. First and foremost, it is idolatry in the sense that it can only exist when a person thinks of life consisting in things possessed rather than in righteous relationship to God. It is also a sin against other people because to fulfill the desire, other people are wronged. Finally, it is self-destructive because these erroneous conceptions and activities always react upon the soul to bring about its own undoing. Every godly man seeks his happiness in God. The covetous man seeks that in his money, which God alone can give. Therefore, his covetousness is properly idolatry. None of the sins that are mentioned are part of Jesus' way of life. Instead, they are part of the way the world lives. Every Christian is faced with a question. Who will I identify with, the world or with Jesus? The wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. These sins invite the wrath of God. Because the world treasures this kind of sinful lifestyle, they don't come in humility to Jesus. One sin is enough to send anyone to hell, but there are levels of condemnation. Matthew chapter 23, verse 14. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you swallow up widows' houses, and to cover it up you make long prayers. Therefore you will receive the greater condemnation. James chapter 2, verse 10. For whoever keeps the whole law, but stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of breaking all of it. In part, the wrath of God comes as God allows men to continue in sinful, and therefore self-destructive, behavior. Romans chapter 1, verse 24 to 32, Amplified Bible. Therefore, God gave them over in the lusts of their own hearts to sexual impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them, abandoning them to the degrading power of sin, because, by choice, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature, rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, or consider Him worth knowing as their Creator, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do things which are improper and repulsive, until they were filled, permeated, saturated with every kind of unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, and mean-spiritedness. They are gossips, spreading rumors, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of new forms of evil, disobedient and disrespectful to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful, without pity. Although they know God's righteous decree and His judgment, that those who do such things deserve death, yet they not only do them, but they even enthusiastically approve and tolerate others who practice them. We read, In which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. These sins may be a sign that the world is currently rebelling against God, but for Christians, they are in the past tense. To put it more simply, Christians should not live their lives in the same manner as the sons of disobedience. Sin is never a comfortable place to be for a genuine follower of Christ. Paul says that Christians once walked in these sins. It is possible though tragic, that these sins should occasionally mark a Christian's life, but they must not be a Christian's walk, their manner of living. When Jesus Christ entered Paul's life, it ushered in a period of profound transformation. When Christ comes into a person's life, he makes that person a new creation, and Colossians chapter 3 walks us through the profound changes that occur as a result. Our personal hearts are radically affected. Paul viewed new life in Christ as a life resurrected. Neither regulation nor reformation can usurp the resurrection dynamic required to explain the radical changes that Christ brings. Given such a resurrection, our call is to seek those things which are above. Why? 
because we were previously dead in sin, we are now alive. Our identity is in Him. Christ has a profound impact on our moral habits. Paul draws a parallel between the radical transformation that occurs in the life of a Christian and the transition from wearing rags to robes. To begin, Christians strip themselves of their filthy rags, representing our former lives and moral behaviors. Before we were rescued, we were subjugated by our previous behaviors. Putting an old way of life put to death means discarding it as if it were already dead. Paul lists distinct vices we are to put to death. These vices fit into two categories and cover everyday life's broad scope. Sinful actions, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, idolatry, sinful attitudes, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication, and lying. Christians must never make these garments part of their moral wardrobe. Next, Christians put on the virtues of the new life. The new clothes Christ provides are also listed in two broad categories. Heart of compassion, which means mercy ruling the life of the believer. Kindness, which means goodness of heart, a sweet disposition, seeing our neighbor's welfare is as important as our own. Christ-like responses. Humility, which means modest appraisal of self. The focus is on giving up our rights for the sake of others. Meekness, which means quiet yet rock-solid strength. Long-suffering, which means ability to put up with difficult people. Forbearance, which means putting up with things we find distasteful. Forgiveness means offering to others what our Lord freely and graciously offers to us. Love, which means the moral color which saturates every other garment in the Christian closet. When Christ enters our lives, all things become new. God's peace is to rule in our heart. Whatever the subject at hand, the Apostle Paul is ready to place Christ ahead of all. For him, to think of life is to think of Christ. This included the matter of lust. He said, For to me, to live is Christ. He is my source of joy, my reason to live, and to die is gain, for I will be with him in eternity. When Jesus Christ came into Paul's life, radical changes took place. Colossians chapter 3 walks us through the radical changes Christ makes when he enters a person's life, making that person a new creation. Colossians chapter 3, verse 2 through 5, Amplified Bible. Set your mind and keep focused habitually on the things above, the heavenly things, not on the things that are on the earth, which have only temporal value. For you died to this world, and your new, real life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. So put to death and deprive of power the evil longings of your earthly body with its sensual, self-centered instincts, immorality, impurity, sinful passion, evil desire, and greed, which is a kind of idolatry because it replaces your devotion to God. We read, If then you were raised with Christ. Paul begins a section in which he will focus on practical Christian living with the clear understanding that practical Christian living is built on the foundation of theological truth. In other words, theological truth is the foundation upon which practical Christian living is built. Because we are confident in the reality of Jesus' resurrection from the dead, our identification with Him becomes real. It is only because we were raised with Christ that we can seek those things which are above. Paul uses the act of baptism to illustrate the spiritual reality of being raised with Christ in Colossians chapter 2, verse 12, where the concept of being raised with Christ is first presented. Now that we have been brought up in the Christian faith, we should behave in a certain way because it is fitting for us. We read the phrase, set your mind on things above. The best Christian living comes from minds that are fixed on heaven. They realize that their lives are now hidden with Christ and God, and since Jesus is enthroned in heaven, their thoughts and hearts are connected to heaven also. The believer is to seek the things above. The word seek marks aspiration, desire, and passion. In order to seek these things, the mind must be set on them. Morgan. Love heavenly things. Study them. Let your hearts be entirely engrossed by them. Now that you are converted to God, Act in reference to heavenly things, as ye did formerly in reference to those of earth. Clark Earthly things are not all evil, but some of them are. 
Even things harmless in themselves become harmful if permitted to take the place that should be reserved for the things above. Vaughn The battle begins in the mind. Paul argues that since we have a new position, we need to get a new perspective. Permanent change and improvement always happen from the inside out. Consider Paul's prescription for self-discipline. Number 1. Remember your identity. We must focus first on our position in Christ. It all starts there. Number 2. Renew your thought life. We must focus our minds on things above. We must raise new internal standards. Number 3. Recognize your old life is dead. Change doesn't happen if we maintain any way to return to old patterns. Number 4. Release past habits. We must put off the old, like taking off a worn-out set of clothes. Number 5. Replace them with new ones. We get rid of old habits only when we substitute new habits for them.